Okay, what I'd like to do today is to take three giant steps back and try to uh, place the issues that you've been grappling with this semester in a broad conceptual and historical framework. And I'd also like to scan various possibilities for the future with the, with the hopes of shedding further light on the challenges before us and to, if, with any luck, stimulate some discussion on what we need to do and how we need to be. For it seems that we live in an extraordinary moment in the 4.5 billion year history of this planet. Some kind of global society is taking shape. But its outcome is profoundly uncertain. Now I find that many people find it frighteningly easy to envision very dark futures of, of impoverished people and culture and nature. As a matter of fact, many people seem to think that's the business as usual scenario. Uh, I'm often reminded in having discussions like this of the words of the uh, existential philosopher Woody Allen, <laughs> who once uh, said, like no other time in history, humanity is at a crossroads. And one path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other path leads to total destruction. <laughs> may we have the courage to choose wisely. But I think we do what we do, and I think you're here because we think there's other possibilities, and that while it may seem highly improbable that a transition to a world of enriched lives and human solidarity and a healthy planet is still possible. And that's the subject of a recent essay uh, the, of the Global Scenario Group. Let me tell you just a few words about the Global Scenario Group. Glo Global Scenario Group was formed in 1995. It was convened by the Stockholm Environment Institute to provide a forum for a fairly diverse international group of people to consider the possibilities and to analyze the possibilities for a sustainable world. The research of the Global Scenario Group has been picked up by numerous uh, global assessments on various aspects, whether it be energy, water, land, agriculture, and so on. And in particular was the uh, foundation for the scenario chapter of the GEO report that I guess you must have come across in this course. Uh, I am not going to burden you with the technical details today. If you're curious, you can download this essay. I also brought a copy, so if any, it would be a door prize, whoever asks the most friendly question. But the, uh, some of the technical reports to back up, you know, some of the numbers and the modeling and so on will be found at, at this website if you want to dig uh, a little deeper. So transitions are everywhere in nature. Many different systems evolve gradually, then enter a period of rapid change, and eventually emerge in a new state of quasi-stability. And we can track change from the stages of takeoff, acceleration, and stabilization. But with the emergence of proto-humans, a powerful new factor cultural development, accelerated change on the planet, and brought a new kind of transition between the phases of human history. Now, of course, there are no sharp demarcations. Uh, history is a, a messy business. But with a long view, we can see two great macro transformations in the history of modern man. Stone Age culture lasted about 100,000 years before Early civilization arose roughly 10,000 years ago. And early civilization, in turn, gave way to the modern era over the last millennium. Now, our, our assertion now is that we are in the midst of a third great transition to what we call the planetary phase of civilization. And we seem to be about there. Now, note that if this were to occur over roughly 100 years, and I think that's not an unreasonable hypothesis, that a pattern of historic acceleration would continue. And we can see that by switching to a logarithmic scale for the time axis. 
Now in this long process, the complexity of society increased along many different dimensions. I mean, for example, social organization moved from the level of the tribe to the city-state, to the nation, to the planet. And the economic basis from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, industrial capitalism, and the globalizing economy of our own time. Communication from the evolution of language, to writing, printing, and the modern information revolution. But the defining feature of the planetary transition is increasing global connectivity. And there were many early expressions of this. For example, the formation of the United Nations. Or on a more symbolic level, the Apollo mission that first transmitted back that iconic vision of our, our fragile blue planet afloat in the cosmos that became everybody's logo. But the real takeoff, I think, was over the last couple of decades. And the signals included environmental change at the scale of the biosphere, the revolution in information and communications technology that is shrinking our world, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the increasing hegemony of global capitalism, the emergence of new actors such as the World Trade Organization, multinational corporation, and the appearance of a new global species, which I call Davos Man. At the same time, there was the Earth Summit and the emergence of globally linked civil society as a force in world affairs, and the appearance of a new species of global skeptic, a Seattle woman. But we should also mention here global terrorism because fundamentalist reaction, I think, is also part of the story of global transition. So as these various trends and driving forces unfold and, and interact with new factors and behaviors and contingencies, the global trajectory can branch into fundamentally uh, different directions. The question is, is there a way of organizing this evolution towards a sustainable, just, and desirable future? Now, the word sustainable development is in everyone's lexicon these days, but it probably has as many meanings as people who use it. But one thing it tends to mean to most people is the idea of passing on an undiminished world to the future. So it becomes then a question of moral and scientific imperative to study the future. Right? If you care about sustainability, you've got to find out what actions now are going to get us on the right track so it's compatible with those normative directions. So over the last 20 years, a new scientific discipline has emerged to consider properties, dynamics, possibilities of the future. Prior to that, that was the realm of the, you know, the mystics, the seers, the poets, and the futurists, and Hermann Kahn, if you know who he is. Um, <coughs> so, um, how, how can you think about the future in an organized way? This is a tremendously challenging methodological problem. Because we're not only needing to think about the future of a complex global system, but also a system that is inherently normative insofar as it has people with values inside it. It seems we live at a time for choices when the decisions that we make can dramatically influence the pathway that the global system takes in the coming decades. Now, we can't predict the future. And there's actually three kinds of uncertainty that one could point to. I call them ignorance, surprise, and volition. Ignorance because even if this were a deterministic system like a billiard table, our ignorance of the, of the state of the system and of the forces driving it would lead to a dispersion over, uh, a classical kind of dispersion over future states as Newton would have predicted. But it's not a classical system. It has the potential for surprise, novelty, and unfolding of new phenomena. So that even if we had absolute knowledge of the current conditions and the forces driving it, we would not be able to predict its outcome. And then there's this problem of choice. That to the degree we believe in free will, and I don't think we'd be sitting here if we didn't, uh, that part of the system and part of the introduction of uncertainty is how will people respond to the different situations as they evolve over the coming years. So we can't predict the future, but we can't develop scenarios. 
So what are scenarios? Scenarios are stories about the future with a logical plot and narrative governing the manner in which events unfold. Now, contemporary scenarios are told both in words and numbers. So the narrative allows us to debate and discuss and articulate non-quantifiable aspects that are still key to this whole problem. Culture, values, lifestyle, and more technically, structural reorganizations of the system, which we don't know how to model. On the other hand, models, the quantification, help us to ground all of that and help us to get more detail and precision about those variables which we can quantify. Population, economics, some social variables, environmental conditions, resources, and so on. So the art of this is to combine the richness of the narrative with the rigor of the model and with a good dose of humility and to understand that this is a kind of science that isn't a QED kind of science, but it's one that's done in interaction with people and in discussion, coming to conclusions about where we might be going, where we want to go, and how we get there. So how do we understand this truly complex phenomena? Well, it poses great challenges to science, to policy, and to everyone who's trying to understand the world they live in. We need an integrated view as this complexity and interaction increases. So we need to look across sectors, across themes, and also across scales, because different issues come into focus as we zoom between spatial scales. To see climate change, you have to go out to the global level, where you see the global economy and migration and geopolitics. If you want to see a river basin, you have to zoom down. If you want to see an ecosystem, you may zoom over here. If you want to look at a sustainable community efforts, Zoom down even farther. But as global connectivity increases, then the future of nations and regions and communities is increasingly coupled to the destiny of the planet. So if you care about your place, you have to care about your planet. And the old environmental slogan, think globally, act locally, requires its complement, thinking locally, acting globally. So here we have, if you will, three kinds of global scenarios. Conventional worlds, barbarization, great transitions, all starting with exactly the same driving forces. Conventional worlds unfold gradually from these dominant forces. While in barbarization, environmental stress, social polarization and economic instability all reinforce and civilization deteriorates. In great transitions, people eventually respond to this new challenge with fundamentally new values, a strong sense of human solidarity, and deep respect for nature. Now to unpack this a little, let's consider two variations on conventional worlds. In market forces, powerful actors drive the priority of economic growth. While in policy reform, the, it would add strong and comprehensive government initiatives that constrain and redirect the economy in order to meet a wide range of social and environmental goals. So market forces, that's the IMF stream. I, someone called it at one of these talks. And policy reform, that's Kofi Annan's dream. Now, two kinds of barbarization we call fortress world and breakdown. Fortress world is an authoritarian response to the threat of global crisis. A kind of global apartheid is imposed with the elites in an arp archipelago of connected enclaves and an impoverished majority outside. Bubbles of privilege in a sea of poverty. This is the one, by the way, that most people who hear this scheme think is business as usual, which is frightening in its own right. <laughs> in the breakdown scenario, crisis and conflict spiral out of control. Institutions collapse. Technological memory is lost. Two kinds of great transitions. 
It's called Eco-Communalism and the New Sustainability Paradigm. Eco-Communalism is a highly localist vision that's favored by many anarchist and environmental subcultures. But we focus on this new sustainability paradigm that sees in globalization not only a threat to retreat from, but also an opportunity, an opportunity to forge new categories of consciousness, global citizenship, humanity as a whole, and its place in the web of life, and its link to the fate of the earth. So rather than retreat into localism, this new paradigm would seek to change the character of globalization. So it would validate cultural interdependence, economic interdependence, global solidarity, while seeking a ecological and humanistic transition. Now the last 30 years, from the Stockholm meeting in 1972 on the human environment, I would say through the Brundtland Report of the 80s and the Earth Summit of 92 and the World Summit on Sustainability in 2002, right on through, has centered here. Matter of fact, my career has centered there. <coughs> um, now that may have started the transition, but to complete it will require the new paradigm of a great transition. Now these different visions of the future really are different worldviews. They represent really different worldviews. They're sort of, in a way, uh, old wine and new bottles. And to explore this further, here are our scenarios again. Three classes, the great transitions, barbarization, and conventional world. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And two variations in each for a total of six scenarios. Now with tongue firmly in cheek, Let's ask who might be the antecedents for these worldviews, a snapshot of the philosophy and a possible motto. Well, market, the market foresight it probably goes back to you know, Adam Smith as a, an appropriate antecedent. It's the philosophy of market optimism and faith in the hidden and enlightened hand of the market. And the motto might be, don't worry, be happy. Policy reform, one might think of Keynes, and in a more co contemporary context, Brundtland, and which really was the Brundtland, the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future of the 80s, was the seminal paper on sustainable development. And this is the philosophy of policy stewardship, environment and equity through better technology. A forerunner of breakdown might be Parson Malthus, writing in the late 18th century, the existential gloom, the inevitability of population and resource catastrophe, the motto, the end is coming, nothing we can do about it. A forerunner of Fortress World, Thomas Hobbes, 17th century, is concerned with social chaos and belief in the underlying nastiness of human nature and the need for order through strong leaders. The eco-communalism vision perhaps could be traced to the 19th century social utopians, Morris and the others, in an entirely different context, the traditionalism of Gandhi. It's a philosophy of pastoral romance and belief in the ultimate goodness of human nature and great fear of industrialization. And the motto, of course, is small is beautiful. And then this new paradigm. Any volunteers? Well, maybe the definitive piece hasn't been written yet, so. I throw that out as a dissertation assignment for anybody who's looking for. And this is the philosophy of sustainability as progressive global development. The motto, human solidarity, new values, the art of living. Now, but this typology of visions actually leaves out the most common one of all. And that's having absolutely no vision whatsoever. And I'm here to tell you that my own brother-in-law is a very good example. <laughs> of this. And I suspect there's somebody in your family, maybe a Thanksgiving dinner or something, that also fits the bill. So this is the philosophy of muddle through. Don't bother me with your grand philosophies. You'll only make it worse. The motto is que sera, sera. 
So just for fun, let us imagine that we ask a representative of each of these worldviews to comment on the metaphor. Society is a ship in troubled waters. So the market optimists say, onward, keep the shops and casinos open. The reformists said, improve the navigation system, call a meeting. And there have been a lot of meetings, actually. <laughs> And the catastrophists, remember the Titanic, we're sinking exponentially. And the authoritarians, oh captain, my captain, beware of mutiny, secure the first class deck. <laughs> and the smallest beautiful types, abandoned ships sail to tranquil ponds in small boats. And a new paradigm, look a passage to a better sea, if, if, if. Oh, yeah, my brother-in-law will wake me if something happens. If he... <laughs> okay, so the bold vision of market forces is to forge a globally integrated free market. And its policy agenda is the mantra of the so-called Washington Consensus. Modernization, liberalization, deregulation, privatization, structural adjustment, free trade, you name it. Um, but its colossal risk is that it would succumb to its own contradictions. Environmental degradation despite technological advance. Human desperation despite growing aggregate wealth. And cultural polarization despite greater interdependence. If market adaptations fail, then environmental stress, inequity, resentment, conflict, xenophobia, they could reinforce. And out of the turbulence, a fortress world could consolidate. And this would be a tragic negation of hopes for a better world. Now, from the agony of the 20th century, those hopes were crystallized in four great aspirations for global society. Peace, freedom, development, and a healthy environment. But the trends are perilous. Conflict, inequity, and poverty persists, while stresses on the environment increase. Sustainability would require radically bending these curves towards decreased conflict, much greater equity, and lower poverty and environmental renewal. Now, policy reform would take up the challenge. But the question, is it enough? Well, here's where we did an awful lot of analysis, and we showed, in fact, it is enough in principle, in the sense that the technologies and policy instruments are available for reconciling environmental growth and market-driven globalization with a wide set of environmental and social goals. But it's extremely daunting in practice that gradually bending highly unsustainable trends imposes immense technological and political challenges. It's like trying to go up the down escalator. And the ultimate uncertainty about this is where would the political will come from for such a vast and sustained program? It's nowhere in sight. So reform may not be enough, alas. But even if it were enough, even if it were technologically and politically feasible, there would still remain another kind of question, a normative question. Does it offer an attractive vision of the future? Or might it lead to a sustainable but undesirable world? Kind of a global mall where the environment continues to function in some sense, and fewer people starve, but not a place of human contentment and exploration. So this reconsideration of the meaning of the good life is fundamental to a great transition. What is the point of development? The new sustainability paradigm goes back to the question posed by Socrates many years ago. How shall we live? So it's a values-led scenario that prioritizes the quality of life 
not just the quantity of things, that makes strong human connectedness a part of the good life, and that understands humanity as part of a vibrant community of life on the third planet. It's also a pluralistic scenario where regions pursue different directions towards modernism, many of them based on local traditions and resources. So whereas conventional world strategies would focus on the, what I call approximate drivers that directly influence demographics and the economy and technology and governance, great transition strategies invite us to go to the ultimate drivers that shape society and the human experience. Values, knowledge, power, and culture. And where proximate drivers might be responsive to near-term interventions, the ultimate drivers are subject to gradual political and cultural processes that can expand the frontier of what's possible by changing the basis of human choice. So look that slightly differently. In market forces, it would, it would maintain the correlation between a sense of well-being, the level of material consumption, and throughput. Throughput, the flow of resources through an economy. Now policy reform would decouple consumption from throughput through better technology, a dematerialization way. While great transitions would add a lifestyle wedge, that after a satisfactory standard of living for all, it would break the link between the sense of well-being and consumption. And with regard to poverty, market forces, the gap between rich and poor persists. And at the bottom of the economic pyramid, a billion people remain mired in absolute poverty. A policy reform would seek to bring up the bottom through targeted programs to alleviate poverty, while great transitions is rooted in building more equitable social relations. Now, a great transition would actually be comprised of a myriad of sub-transitions across every aspect of culture. So a values transition would challenge consumerism and individualism, the domination of nature. A knowledge transition would emphasize systemic approaches. A demographic transition would stabilize populations and start to build sustainable communities. A social transition would ensure universal rights and eradicate poverty. An economic transition would make the economy a way of serving people and sparing the environment. A governance transition would build partnerships among stakeholders at all levels in some kind of a nested governance system. A technology transition would certainly include deep efficiency, renewable resources, and industrial ecology. But who will change the world? What social actors could carry forward such a program? Well, there's no easy answers. It would certainly involve a myriad of actors north and south, east and west. But let's look at four major agents of change. Three are global actors. Intergovernmental organizations, civil society, and the private sector. But will intergovernmental organizations be able to reinvent themselves and overcome the fragmentation of national geopolitics to become a true civil service? Will business enterprises be redesigned so that social purposes is at the center of their mission? Will civil society overcome its fragmentation and confrontational culture to become more unified around a common vision and principles? Well, the answer ultimately depends on the fourth group, the quality of awareness and engagement of the citizens of the world. 
We found it impossible to tell a compelling story of a great transition without positing the formation of a global citizens movement for one. And the situation is somewhat urgent. Now, I've been talking in very simplistic terms about pure case scenarios of market forces and eco-communalism and fortress world. Well, in fact, as you know, the world is a complicated place of mixed tendencies, uh, <coughs> some, some more dominant than others. And our global scenario group, we've told stories about many different futures, depending on events and, and choices and activities. It's fairly easy, I think, to tell a compelling story about a fortress world. I mean, for example, the forces for a great transition and policy reform remain weak. Market forces leads to some kind of a crisis, and out of that comes the consolidation of an authoritarian uh, fortress world solution. It's much harder to tell a story of a great transition. It's much harder for us. And we hope that's our problem and not the world's problem. But we, we, we gave it a shot, and if you ever look at the essay, you'll see a chapter on history of the future, a, a whimsical attempt to tell the history of the great transition from the year 2068. But the key factor is the rise in, in energy and importance of the forces for great transition, which pushes the policy reform agenda, uh, and which allows for a different kind of outcome it, before there is a crisis. The key lesson of all this, the headline, even though we're talking about 2068, the critical thing is what happens in the next five to 10 years in terms of changing the mix of tendencies so that the response to various crises that may come along will be more felicitous than it might otherwise be. So we return to a simple question, the one we began with. <laughs> Which world do we want? The first wave of sustainable development centered on better technology, poverty alleviation, and incremental changes to market-driven globalization. Now we need a second wave that brings human values, lifestyles, and institutions to the center of debate and research and action. So we need a new global vision that is at once legitimate, coherent, inspiring, and rigorous. And we need that so that we can challenge conventional thinking and inspire people to seize the public imagination, as well as broaden the political base for change. And we need to get started. So there's a continuing role for scientists to make the case for to the media to raise public awareness, for corporations and trade unions to spearhead a transformation in the private sector, for parliamentarians to carry it into policy, and for educators to lay the more enduring foundations. But I think the linchpin is, is civil society. To the degree it remains fragmented and reactive, then I think the basis for hope shrinks. But the, the, degree, the degree to which it can unify around a common vision and principles and framework, then I think a, a mov movement for a sustainable future will have found its, its natural voice. So sustainability is kind of, the way I look at it, it's kind of the necessity that, that pushes a great transition, while the vision of a better life is a magnet that pulls it forward. But to get there, the curve of development has to be bent twice, that a radical revision of technological means can begin the transition, but a reconsideration of human ends is needed to complete it. And that is the promise and lure of the global future. Okay, thanks.